be able to talk about God's faithfulness to the nation of Israel. Um, I want to begin with a, a part of an essay that, uh, that was written by Mark Twain in 1898. Mark Twain was uh, a man who was certainly not a, uh, an Orthodox Christian believer by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but he went to Israel and he studied, uh, at least anecdotally, quite a bit about the Jewish people. And he said this, he writes, if the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of, has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are also a way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all of the ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they're gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Twain makes a good point, and he asks a very important question. It's a question that has been asked uh, throughout history. When people look at the Jewish people and they see the history of persecution and the attempts to annihilate the little nation, how is it that they still remain? And as Twain says uh, so well, what is the secret of the Jews' immortality? Well, the Jewish people have been the target of innumerable acts of persecution, more than any other people group in history. Uh, just consider, they've survived Pharaoh's Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, Xerxes' Persia, Alexander's Greece, Vespasian's Rome, the Pope's Europe, and Hitler's Germany. And that's not to mention the Palestinian intifadas or the bombings, stabbings, shootings, and every other form of violence one could imagine that have been uh, perpetrated on these people. They seem to be immortal. And so as Twain asks, what's the secret to their immortality? Well, the Bible gives us the answer to that. Uh, the Christian, the person who reads their Bible and studies it, knows that the Jewish people are unique. But, he, but the Bible tells us that the secret for these people is not their size, it's not their uh, great power, it's the one called the strength of Israel, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob. In his word, God makes it crystal clear that the Jewish people are his chosen people. In fact, he calls them in the book of Zechariah, the apple of his eye. But it is also clear that God did not choose the Jewish people because they are special. Rather, the Jewish people are special because God chose them. His choosing of them made them special and made them unique. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, God reminds Israel that they are the chosen people and that he delivered them out of Israel because of his faithfulness, not their own. And this is what it says. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Because of God's sovereignty, he in his sovereignty chose to 
love a people that didn't even exist. He formed them out of one man. And it was from that nation and to that nation that he made uh, some very distinct promises, which we'll get into in just a little while. But many Christians support Israel because Israel in its past, its present, and its future is a testament to God's faithfulness. So let's first consider Israel's uh, past, and God's faithfulness to Israel in the past. Uh, God's dealings with Israel in the past demonstrate his great faithfulness despite the nation's infidelity to him. And this cannot be um, missed when one reads the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, God makes a unilateral, unconditional, and eternal covenant with Abram, later known as Abraham. This covenant is the bedrock of Israel's existence and their purpose. In it, God promises a land, a legacy, a nation, and great blessing. Well, let's break this down a little bit. First of all, we said that the Abrahamic covenant, as it's known, is unilateral. Unilateral means one-sided, and that God is the only one who makes any commitments in the covenant. In fact, while God is ratifying the covenant in Genesis chapter 15, we find Abram asleep on the ground. He's not contributing anything at all to the covenant that God is making. So it is unilateral and that God alone is making uh, promises to Abram. The covenant is also unconditional. And it's unconditional because God does not say in this covenant, Abram, I will do ABC if you do XYZ. It's not a, a tit for tat exchange. God makes these promises, these promises of land, of legacy, of blessing and nationhood to Abram without any strings attached at all. It is entirely God's grace and his mercy on Abram and his descendants. And then finally, the Abrahamic covenant is eternal. It's eternal because, frankly, God said so. Uh, in Genesis uh, verse, uh, chapter 17, verses 7 through 8, God says, to uh, Abram, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, at this point, you might say, wait a minute. I've read the Old Testament, I've read the history of the Jewish people, and I thought Israel was taken out of their land multiple times. So how can you say that it's been their everlasting possession? Well, that's a good question, um, and it's, it's an important one that we need to look at Scripture to understand. And for that, we look to Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapters 28 through 30, where God establishes another covenant with Israel. This one often referred to as the Palestinian covenant, or I like the land covenant, because that's what it pertains to. Covenant is where we faithfulness to the Jewish people in high definition. So while the Abrahamic covenant is God's promise to Israel that he will always be their God and that they would always be his chosen people, the land covenant stipulates that in order to enjoy the blessings of God, Israel must be obedient to the Lord. After giving the nation a list of the blessings that would come upon them for obedience, God in Deuteronomy 28 shifts to a list of curses. And it's a long list of curses. It's much longer than the blessings. And these curses would come on the nation because of their national disobedience. In the event of national disobedience, rebellion against God, as his chosen people, God has said, I'm going to chasten you. And they're going to come certain curses to you. And dominating the list of curses is Israel's removal from their land by Gentile nations, enemy nations, and then Israel's subsequent subjugation and abuse uh, that they would receive as a result from the Gentiles. They're scattered throughout the world because of disobedience. But at the tail end of this, in Deuteronomy 30, God also promises that if the nation truly repents of their sin, and that's a change of mind. They change from their own rebellion towards uh, the living God by faith, and it would result in their restoration to the land. Well, throughout Israel's history, it's endured three exiles. Uh, they've had the Assyrian, the Babylonian, and the Roman. And during each of these exiles from the land, 
Israel was persecuted greatly by the Gentile power that was dominating them, just as God said would be the case. In all of these exiles, though, despite the persecution, despite the attempts to assimilate the Jewish people into the pagan cultures, God was faithful to his word and to his chosen people. He never allowed them to be completely swallowed up by the prevailing pagan culture in which they found themselves. He has never allowed them to be destroyed, and he has kept his promise to return them to the land. We have the state of Israel today, which uh, I believe is at least partial fulfillment of that promise in Deuteronomy 30. God's faithfulness to Israel in their past is remembered in the Jewish feasts uh, of Israel, particularly in Passover. The nation of Israel was held in bondage by Egypt for 400 years, but God raised up a leader among them, Moses, to lead the nation out of Egypt and into the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abram. And each year during the Passover Seder, I've had the privilege of going to uh, a number of these, one of them just um, a year ago. And at these, these Seders, these are commemorative meals. They're retellings of the uh, really God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, bringing them out of Egypt, of the Exodus. And during the Seder, the Jewish people sing a centuries-old song called Dayenu, which means it would have been enough. The lyrics list the many things God did for Israel during the Exodus, and each line ends with the word Dayenu, it was enough. So here, I'll, I'll just give you a sample. It says, if he had taken us out of Egypt and not made judgments on them, Dayenu, it would have been enough for us. If he had made judgments on them and had not made them on their gods, Dayenu. If he had made them on their gods and had not killed their firstborn, Dayenu, and so on. The song goes. Well, each line of that song is a reminder to the Jewish people, even today, of God's faithfulness to their nation and of how he did above and beyond anything the Jewish people could have asked for. So indeed, the telling of Israel's long and painful history, we must admit it's been a long and painful one, but in telling it, we're telling the story that should be punctuated always by the phrase, Dayenu. Israel has given God countless reasons to cast them off or to destroy them or to replace them with another more faithful people as uh, some in Christendom proclaim today. But the word makes it very clear that God has not cast them off. He has not replaced them. He has not destroyed them. And it's because he's true to his word. He is faithful to do that to which he has committed himself. The preservation of Israel is intimately wrapped up in the very character of God. Well, let's consider Israel's present. It's been said that when Blaise Pascal, the renowned mathematician and theologian, was asked by Francis King Louis XIV what proof he had for the existence of God, Pascal didn't give a, a great theoretical uh, answer. He didn't uh, use many of the answers that apologists might give today, as, as important as those are. He responded instead emphatically, why the Jews, your majesty, the Jews. And I agree with Pascal. The continued existence and the thrivance of the Jewish people is a powerful evidence, not only of the existence of God, but for the Christian, of his faithfulness. Sometimes in speaking with my Jewish friends, uh, particularly those who survived the Holocaust or who had family members who survived, well, they'll ask me, how I can trust in a God who turned his back on his so-called Jewish uh, or so-called chosen people. And my answer always is that one of the reasons I trust him is because the existence of the Jewish people, in spite of the satanic attempts to annihilate them by Adolf Hitler and others, is a demonstration of his power and of his plan and of his sovereignty. The fact that we can talk with Jewish people today, the fact that we have synagogues in our community, the fact that we have Jewish friends, they are all testaments to the fact that God has not forsaken them and that he is faithful to his word. Their existence cries out for the existence of God. God has not forgotten his chosen people. In his letter to the Romans, the apostle Paul, a Jewish man himself, reminds the church of this very point. In Romans 9, chapters 4 through 5, he tells the church at Rome that it is the Jewish nation, quote, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, 
of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ or Messiah came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. See, no other nation has ever received or will ever receive the kinds of blessings that Israel has. But Paul also says that he has great sorrow and continual grief in his heart because of the spiritual condition of his people. And so in Romans 10, Paul contrasts the position of Israel as God's chosen people, a position that never changes, to their condition. In Romans 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul writes, Brethren, so he's speaking here to the, the church at Rome. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And what is the righteousness of God? Well, Paul gives us the answer in verse four. He says, for Christ or for Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Remember, Paul is writing this letter under the inspiration of God. So what he says is the very word of God himself. And with that in mind, I want to, in just a moment, take a look at what Paul doesn't say about Israel's condition. Paul says, first of all, that conditionally the Jewish people are unsaved. Uh, and they are unsaved because although they are zealous for the God of their fathers and they're zealous for spiritual traditions, their zeal is not rooted in knowledge. And this is not something that only pertains to the Jewish people, by the way. This is something that is uh, part of the human condition. We have this desire for religion and for uh, a spiritual void in our lives to be filled. And yet, if we don't fill it with the right thing, with the right one, I should say, then we are lost. And so he says, although they're zealous for the God of their fathers, their zeal is not rooted in knowledge. It's not in the scriptures that God committed to them. And because of their ignorance of God's word, where he declares in Isaiah 53, among other places, that his Messiah would come to take the sin of the nation and the whole world upon himself and would justify by his blood all who by faith put their trust in him. Because of their ignorance of this message of God's word and his righteousness, which is the Messiah, the Jewish people seek to establish their own righteousness instead. This is the pitiful spiritual condition of the Jewish people generally today. But if you're following along in Romans 9, take a look at verses 4 and 5, because in Romans 9, 4, and 5, Paul does not say some very important things. Paul does not say that the Jewish people were chosen. He does not say that Israel was entrusted with the blessings of adoption and the glory and the covenants, the law, the temple service, the covenantal promises, and the patriarchs once upon a time in the past. If he said that, we would have reason to think that God has replaced Israel. But he says, rather, that the Jewish people are chosen, that these blessings currently pertain to the nation of Israel. What does it mean? That just as God was faithful to a rebellious and unfaithful Israel in the past, he continues, even now in 2020, to be faithful to them because of his immutable character. Well, finally, let's look at Israel's future and God's faithfulness. Not only should God's faithfulness to Israel in the past and present be a motivation for Christians to support Israel, his faithfulness to them in the future should be as well. On numerous occasions throughout the Old Testament, God promises Israel that once they repent of their sin, he will return the nation from their exile to the land he promised them as an everlasting possession. Some of these promises had both an immediate and a future fulfillment. So consider Jeremiah chapter 31. While the prophet was writing to his people of an impending judgment, namely the Babylonian captivity, his message also looked forward to a time of ultimate national repentance in the last day. In Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 37, we read this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor 
and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done. So God's message to the wayward nation is clear. Despite their sin, he is gracious. Despite their idolatry, he remains a loving, faithful father. And despite their unfaithfulness, he remains faithful to them as a nation. God says that Israel will have the law of God etched permanently on their hearts. They will be a nation of saved people, the only nation God has promised to save totally in the last days. The Apostle Paul, inspired by that same spirit, the Holy Spirit, as Jeremiah, echoes this message in Romans 11, verses 25 through 29. And there he warns Gentile Christians not to become proud against the Jewish people. And he writes, For I do not desire, brothers, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The arrogance of the church towards the nation of Israel uh, is a part of fact. And when I say the church, I mean Christendom in general. Uh, Catholic and Protestant uh, Christendom have not been friends of the Jewish people throughout their history. Here's a picture of, uh, of a sculpture, actually two sculptures, uh, at a church in France, or excuse me, in Strasbourg in France. And one on the left is Ecclesia, representing the church. Next to her is the forlorn and defeated synagogue, representing Israel. And the message here is clear. The church is victorious over poor, rejected Israel. And so the messages of both Jeremiah and Paul powerfully contradict this notion, though. They say that God has a plan for Israel. He, is, he will remain faithful to them. Well, that, what then should our response be as Christians in closing? Well, first of all, our response should be to humbly thank God. If we read the Old Testament and our response is merely to shake our heads at the rebellious and hard-hearted Israel, then we're missing the point. The history of Israel is not included in the Bible so that we would be informed of the past, and that's, that's where it ends. Rather, as Paul writes, it's for our example, it's for our learning, so that we could learn about God and how he deals with this nation so we can learn about his character. I don't know about you, but when I read about Israel's sin cycle and repentance, fellowship with God and repeated sin, it's like I'm looking in a mirror of myself. But I'm also reminded of the God who knows our frame and remembers that we are dust. He is a loving God who seeks the repentance of his people. When we read of God's faithfulness to Israel, we ought to thank him because faithfulness to Israel and God's faithfulness to Israel, in spite of their rebellion, ensures that God will not forsake us as believers. A second response is to imitate Christ. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God is not going to change in his relationship with Israel, then we ought to imitate him. We ought to hate what he hates and to love what he loves and who he loves. And that brings us to the final point. Christians should support Israel. This doesn't mean that we agree with every policy move or cultural position that Israel takes, because Israel is not a redeemed nation yet. Supporting Israel, though, means cultivating the same heart for the Jewish people that God has for them. It means we take opportunities to demonstrate the love of the Messiah to them by meeting physical needs. It means we mourn with them and fight back when encountering anti-Semitism. And it means we take the good news to them, the gospel of the Messiah of Israel. Despite their history of disobedience, which the prophets repeatedly condemned, God never allowed the Jewish people to be destroyed. When we look at Jewish history, both ancient and modern, we can't help but see God's hand in it all. He has faithfully cared for his people 
which for the Christian ought to give us confidence that we can trust him too. Israel is indeed a testament to the faithfulness of God. And that's one of the reasons why I am a Christian Zionist and why I support Israel. I hope you do too.